Welcome back to Wester TV. I'm excited to be hosting a very special guest today. Described by Business Insider as a rock star economist whose ideas are changing the world behind the scenes, Professor Charles Calamaris, who is the Henry Kaufman Professor of Financial Institutions at Columbia Business School. During his career, he has held numerous positions on international and national committees and has authored a range of critically acclaimed books, including Fragile by Design, The Political Origins of Banking Crises, and more recently, Reforming Financial Regulation After Dodd-Frank. I guess we'll kick it off by, uh, by way of introduction. Could you just give us a brief overview of your background as an academic and how you initially became interested in economics? Well, I'd have to go back to a uh, very young age. My father was a businessman uh, in real estate, also in banking, self-educated, and extremely curious intellectually. He didn't graduate high school, but he was extremely curious about all that was going on around him and very civically involved. And I think the fact that he didn't go to high school made him value education even more. And so I got uh, interested from conversations from age, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, uh, getting involved in his business, got very interested in economics, but not just in economics. He was broadly interested in philosophy and history and so I think I'd have to say it was my father's influence, ironically, partly because he wasn't very well educated, I think, formally at least. He really uh, made such an effort and valued it so much. Your key research areas include banking and financial history. And of course, what accompanies this is a study of financial crises. Uh, what are a few of the key insights that you've drawn from your decades of research and experience in the sector? Well, I guess, you know, speaking from a kind of 30,000 feet uh, elevation, I would say two insights really stand out. Um, one of them is that financial crises, and especially banking crises, because there are lots of financial crises, but banking crises are a little different. Banking crises don't happen randomly. They're not like uh, shark attacks or mountain lion attacks. Uh, they, they're very non-random. So, for example, some countries, despite the fact that they have volatile economies, like, for example, Canada, a fairly volatile economy throughout its 200-year uh, history, let's say, um, of banking, has never had a banking crisis, whereas in that same period of time, the U.S. has had about 17. So, banking crises are not random events. They're not events that hit all countries at all times. They tend to occur for certain reasons. So that's the first main insight. And the second main insight is that we can pretty well list those reasons. We know why and when banking crises are precipitated. And the third and final point I'd make is that when we dig down a few layers into the onion, what we see is that all of those things are avoidable. And they are, in some sense, political choices. That is, we in the United States have politically chosen to have a very unstable banking system, whereas Canada has politically chosen to have a stable one. And of course, people might say, well, when did I choose that? That wasn't on the ballot. I don't remember choosing it. But effectively, we, through our constitution and our specific uh, political structure and legislative choices that we've made through the years, we've chosen to, uh, to politicize the banking system, to use it for certain political ends that have stapled to that um, a tendency for instability. So I think those are key insights that banking crises, I'll just review them, don't happen randomly. We can list the reasons on a fairly small piece of paper, and those reasons really reflect deeper political choices. So they are avoidable if countries want to avoid them. And I think this is something that's uh, not well understood. The Dodd-Frank Act, which was the huge piece of financial regulation enacted in response to the 2008 global financial crisis, uh, has been the subject of renewed political discussion due to the Trump administration's plans to wind back reforms under the Act. I understand that it's impossible to sum up thousands of pages of regulation in a few sentences, but just to provide some context to the audience, what were the key issues and areas of reform that Dodd-Frank aimed to address when it was enacted in 2010? Oh, there are so many. It was 2,000 pages of legislation that gave rise to hundreds of major pieces of regulation 
maybe thousands of regulations ultimately. Um, I think that uh, I would divide it into two broad categories which are not enough. There are things that don't fit into these categories. One has to do with consumer protection on the theory that consumers had been fooled or that had been treated unfairly in some respects. And all of this, of course, is coming out of the crisis as people's perceived lessons of the crisis, not always bona fide uh, uh, true lessons of the crisis, but a feeling first of the need for more consumer protections so that consumers don't make mistakes uh, that uh, they're drawn into uh, by virtue of lack of information or lack of control somehow. And the second category are ways to make the financial system more resilient by increasing, for example, the amount of equity capital relative to assets of banks and trying to do things that make it less likely that banks will fail. As part of that, there are a whole realm of different reforms. Um, Title II orderly resolution authority was directed in that direction. Um, living wills, so-called living wills for banks so that it would make them easier to wind down. So also to avoid bailouts. So to make the system more stable, and to avoid bailouts as part of that prudential um, reform. And then on the consumer side, setting up the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and instituting certain other changes in law to try to protect consumers. So it, there's a very long, long list of things that were done. Um, some of the ones that are more publicized, the Volcker rule to try to limit banks' involvement in securities trading, although even Volcker didn't claim that that had contributed to the crisis, but he'd been uh, barking up that tree for decades, and he finally got a chance to influence things, and he influenced them that way. And uh, the Durbin Amendment, which was an attempt to uh, uh, affect um, uh, debit card exchange fees. So it's, it's really a very broad uh, – I mean, for example, there were new um, hiring quotas imposed on financial institutions to hire women and minorities. So, it, it, which does that fit? It's neither consumer protection nor prudential protection. It was just political opportunism, I think I would say. That when you have a crisis, as uh, one of o President Obama's advisors said, don't waste it. And what that means is there's an opportunity to push through things you want and to throw them into that same ball of legislation. And so Dodd-Frank was uh, you know, really quite uh, an ambitious and um, uh, large set of uh, changes. Just following up from that, do you think the Dodd-Frank Act was successful in addressing the issues within the financial system, uh, and particularly for the financial stability point that you mentioned? Well, no point in mincing words about it. I think it's a flop, but I think it was a predictable flop. Um, and so let me talk about what that technical term means, flop. Um, economists, when we approach things, we tend to assume that we're on some sort of frontier where there are trade-offs. That is, oh, we're going to, you know, maybe we're going to spend a little bit more of social resources in terms of regulation, but we're going to get some sort of greater stability as a result. Or we're going to spend more resources on regulation, but we're going to get more informed consumers. And so that's a reasonable trade-off. We as economists tend to think, well, we can't tell society whether you should get more stability or more information to consumers at higher cost. What that trade-off is has to be chosen based on preferences. But then we have something called a flop. And a flop means that you're getting less of what you want and you're paying more for it. And so I would say that's the sense in which Dodd-Frank is clearly a flop. Now that doesn't mean that we haven't had some improvements, particularly in financial stability, since Dodd-Frank was passed. But that doesn't make it a success. If you pass capital requirements, when do capital requirements actually do something for you? It's you're supposed to stabilize the banking system. During a recession, during troubled times, they haven't been tested yet. We have had increased capital requirements, increased bank stability. But the real test of those is going to be when we have another major recession. My view is that we have no reason to believe that things will work out better next time than they did last time in terms of the Dodd-Frank reform. So we've paid a, a very heavy cost in terms of reduced lending, increased um, capital requirements and other things, 
but I'm not confident that they'll really promote financial resilience or better consumer behavior. Another example is the reforms of the mortgage lending, because after all, it was risky mortgage lending that got us into this trouble, largely at the behest of that political equilibrium I was describing when we first started off. That is, people in the government wanted risky mortgages to happen. In fact, it's not very well known, but in, as late as 2006, Congress and President Bush signed legislation to encourage the ratings agencies to be more lenient in their ratings of mortgage-backed securities. Again, not something people are very aware of, but there were many things, the so-called GSE Act of 1992, that 2006 legislation. The government is pushing for risk because the government officials benefit from subsidizing risk for their constituents. And so what happened was, in the Dodd-Frank Act, we instituted new quality standards for residential mortgages, two of them. One's called the uh, qu um, Qualified Mortgage Standard and the Qualified Residential Mortgage Standard. But both of these were diluted, and then a loophole was created for both of them, which even Barney Frank has been bemoaning, and he calls this the loophole that ate the standard. And the loophole basically says that anything that Fannie and Freddie underwrite isn't subject to the standard. And so what's happened is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have now taken over the market precisely because they're not subject to the standard. And so was that just an accident or did that happen through a political calculation? Of course it happened through a political calculation and we can understand the lobbying group that in groups that influenced this legislation and this regulatory outcome. And in fact, there are a couple of political science professors at NYU down the street here in New York that have studied it and shown exactly the same things that I forecast in some papers I wrote about this when the Dodd-Frank Act was being passed actually were very much uh, the way things played out. So it, it all comes back to the politics and Dodd-Frank is not a very robust set of reforms. It will not be robust to political pressures when we really need it. But at the same time, it's creating huge costs. So I'm, I'm a believer that we need to institute reform, but not just deregulation. Reform that actually makes the regulations more resilient, more reliable. And I spend a lot of time in my new book um, on reforming financial regulation after Dodd-Frank talking about what that would be. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are about the proposed rollback of the Dodd-Frank Act contained in the Financial Choice Act which has recently passed the U.S. House of Representatives. Well, I commend the Financial Choice Act um, because it's not just deregulation. It's saying if you can find a way to make the uh, capital requirements higher and more credible, then it makes sense to do deregulation. The thing is that, and, and so I agree with the, that principle of the Financial Choice Act, that is, let banks be reliably only spending their own money, not taxpayers' money, through potential bailouts, and then we don't have to micromanage them. I think that's an obvious sort of uh, direction to go in. However, I don't think the Financial Choice Act has answered the question fully of how to create that reliable uh, protection. And that's why uh, I have argued that some additional things need to be done. Moving a little closer back home, in your book, Fragile by Design, you mentioned that Australia's financial system is the reason why Australia has had a relatively crisis-free economy despite an abundance of credit. What are the key areas of strength that you have identified in the Australian financial system? So first of all, um, I would say that the stability goes back to principles um, that were really widely recognized around the world. The US was really the exception. It had to do with wanting to establish a diversified branch banking system throughout the country. What was unusual, though, is that Australia was the only country that I'm aware of that established a diversified branch banking system and then experienced such a severe crisis, and that's the crisis that hit in Australia in 1893. And in 1893, that Australian crisis led to massive bank failures and deposit and losses and really um, had a big effect on the development of the system going forward. Uh, I would point also to the constitutional structure of Australia that has tended to limit the um, successful politicization of the banking system. And I'm not an expert on Australian political history, but I can say that 
I think that that's a, a big part of the story. And then starting really in the 1920s, especially in the 1930s and going on, there were various uh, regulatory reforms in Australia. But what was interesting is uh, none of them really reproduced the circumstances of the subsidization of risk that would lead to a crisis. So Australia, since 1893, has really never decided to use its banking system as a tool for subsidizing risk to such an extent that you would get a banking crisis. And part of it is because, of, I believe, the severity of the 1893 crisis has been a legacy in Australia that has kept uh, the, the political equilibrium from being willing to do that. So I, I, I'm, I don't give you a complete answer, but I think that that's part of the answer. Um, the constitutional structure of Australia is part of the story. And there I would say you can point more generally and say that lots of the former British colonies that are British colonies of colonization, not just British colonies per se, but British colonies of colonization by the Brits, namely Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa, have tended to have more stable banking systems as part of their constitutional traditions coming out of the empire. And that doesn't mean that they're all similar constitutions, but it means that the political circumstances that gave rise to the founding of the banking system were, uh, let's just say, not subject to the same kind of politicized use of the banking system that a revolutionary country like the United States had. So it really does matter if your country is born in revolution. That's uh, one of the lessons that we draw out of this comparison of the U.S. with the other um, British colonies of settled. I guess just to wrap things up, I did have a final question for you, which was whether you had any pieces of advice for any aspiring economists or academics who may be watching this video. First of all, nothing has been done. I think that the, the worst mistake that people make when they're studying economics as high school students or college students is that they're overwhelmed with how much seems to have been done and how authoritative all the economists are and how much material has been written. And I would tell you, in some sense, all of it is wrong. And you should, as a young person, be very inspired to think that we've made a huge amount of progress in the last 20 or 30 years in economics, but we're still mainly getting it wrong. And there's lots of opportunity for fresh thinking. Um, economics is a, an area where there's discipline, that is facts and logic still matter. In much of the humanities, unfortunately, facts and logic have been overtaken by uh, politicization of thinking and, I would say, a lack of freedom of thinking. One of the great things about economics, what makes it a great field, and political science too, to get into is that they're still disciplined by facts and logic in social science, uh, and so that they really can be a place where a fertile mind and an ambitious young person can make huge progress. So I, all I can say to people is, go out there, ask the questions you want to ask, don't let yourself be told by your advisors how to think, don't let them convince you that they've answered them all already, because they haven't. Thank you so much, Professor Karl Morris. I appreciate your time. My pleasure.